Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Nigel Thornton, worked with Atkins for about 20 uh, some years. Um, and uh, my role is as a business development director to uh, seek out, uh, bid, and win projects, and uh, this one uh, included. And this is certainly one of the biggest ones, in fact, the biggest project that uh, we've ever won in the energy sector. Um, and more about that later. What I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about this project but first of all let's start with a success which is the result and on the 13th of April this year very very uh, exciting day for Atkins and actually for F4E the client and for Engage our joint venture because we were one of four people one of four companies who uh, formed the Engage joint venture and we signed what um, Frank Briscoe, the director of F4E, described as one of the largest engineering contracts in Europe <coughs> at, at 150 million euros. And that's a fixed price, by the way, so it's a pretty scary 150 million euros. Um, at 150 million euros, the largest um, uh, contract in Europe in terms of engineering. And I'll explain about the, the, the scope within that 150 million euros as we, as we go through. Um, but just to give you a flavour, um, the total man-hour um, effort that we will put into this contract over the eight years is just short of 1.8 million man-hours and at peak the team will be ar around about 220 people. So what I'm going to talk about this afternoon are really three things. First of all, I'll give you a background to the project. Secondly, um, about uh, the bidding of the project because actually bidding took us a year so it was, it was a project in its own right to actually bid and, and, and you can imagine uh, at fairly substantial cost but you know the old uh, risk and reward equation so you have to put the cost in in order to gain the benefit. And then thirdly I'll tell you a bit about the, the project itself and where we are um, today with the, with the scope. So what's it all about? Well. ITER is um, an experimental reactor. It's, it's aiming to harness fusion energy, and that's effectively what the sun does. But the issue we have here on the Earth, as that slide um, very well illustrates, although obviously clearly the scale of the sun and the tokamak are wrong, but uh, um, the sun is an extremely large um, body. Um, it has pretty high temperatures, 10 million degrees is, uh, is pretty high temperature in anybody's book, um, and it has a pretty low power density. But here on Earth, uh, we're trying to replicate what goes on in the sun in something that's got a radius of only two meters, and in order to replicate it, that means that the temperatures inside the tokamak have to be 100 million degrees. And the aim of ITER is to actually generate some power. For those of you who have been following the fusion program, ITER um, is the successor to JET and I'll show you later the relationship in size between ETA and JET. So what's it all about? Well, I'm really disappointed actually that one of my colleagues, Linda Ashton, isn't here today because Linda, for those of you who know her, is a chemist and she loves equations. So I was going to show her this equation. Um, I, I don't know what the hell it is, but basically <laughs> it's, it's all about D's and T's. But no, this is about uh, two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, which are fused together and under the right circumstances create uh, free neutrons which generate energy. Um, but that's so oversimplifying the science, but that's as far as I'm going because I certainly am not a, um, a fusion scientist. But just to get a feeling for the scale of this thing, I don't know if you can see there, but there's a little guy. I'll point rather than try and use this. Down here. So that's our little man. Uh, to give you a scale of the, the tokamak itself, tokamak, the, the actual vessel is like a, like a hollow donut. That's where the, uh, the plasma is created. But in order to contain the plasma, you've got huge magnetic fields, you've got uh, massive amounts of power going into those magnets, and consequently this whole thing grows enormously. And to give you some idea of the scale, here are some comparisons that I've um, borrowed from one of our ETA colleagues. So the, um, the ETA cryostat itself, the, uh, the vessel, is as tall as the Jefferson Memorial in Washington. I don't know if any of you have been there, but that'll give you a, an understanding of how, high this, how tall this thing is. In terms of the components, um, the vacuum vessel itself, which is shown in that diagram, 8,000 tonnes, 
uh, and that's not dissimilar from the Eiffel Tower. So this is just one component of this, uh, this overall vessel. If you look at the, um, the magnetic coils, this is just one of the magnetic coils, the toroidal coils, and that is as heavy as a, as a jumbo. So I don't know how many, I can't remember how many of these there are, but there are a whole series of them around this thing, so it's like wrapping a whole load of jumbos around the, uh, the, uh, the tokamak. So we're talking massive numbers here. And overall, the ITER um, uh, vessel is 23,000 tons. 23,000 tons, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And for those of you who do know JET, you can see there the comparison between JET and an elephant, uh, sorry, between JET and uh, ITER. And um, uh, JET itself, for those of you who've been to see it, looks pretty big. If you, if you stand outside the vessel on JET, it looks, it looks pretty big. Um, ITER, even bigger, wow. So we are talking some massive scale engineering here. As a result of that, ITER is an international corporation. This could not have been done by one single country. So it's basically a worldwide corporation. It's not the only route to commercial fusion energy. The Americans are carrying on with, a, with an alternative route using lasers, I think. Um, but this is, um, this is a collaboration across many, many countries of the world. Um, and each one of those seven countries has its own domestic agency which is providing um, input to the project. Now, any of you who've worked in a team where there's more than one office working, or there's more than one company working, that's, that gets pretty challenging. Imagine trying to coordinate seven countries. It's, um, it's a really, really interesting and challenging exercise. Um, that's the, the current timetable with first plasma due around 2019 um, and then uh, the buildings starting to be constructed uh, next year and the um, operations carrying on from 2019 for about uh, 10 years. So it's taking more than 10 years to um, conceive and build and it's operating life expected to be 10 years but there's no doubt that uh, the likelihood is that will get extended. It's located in the south of France. There was a massive bun fight about who wanted to host this, particularly between France and Japan. Um, <clears throat> and uh, France won. Japan, um, actually, its consolation prize was to build DEMO, which is the next um, reactor beyond uh, ITER. And DEMO, actually, is the one that will um, actually export power. So it's a bit like WAGA was to the AGR program. It'll be the first... Um, commercial demonstration that you can actually not just uh, hold this plasma together and generate power but you can actually export the power to a, to a turbine. So that's what Japan won as the consolation prize. Um, France meanwhile won the ITER project. It's a Cadarash in the south of France, an existing nuclear facility. Brilliant location for those of you who like the countryside. Um, it's quite close to the Verdun Gorge so if you like walking, climbing, canoeing, the outdoors, fantastic. <coughs> And funny enough, when we said to people, well, you know, we've got jobs at Dune Ray or we've got jobs at uh, ITER, <coughs> we only had one queue. <laughs> uh, that's an early artist's impression. We've got a, I've got a more up-to-date one. This was, this was uh, what we were given when we were starting to bid. But basically, you can see the, um, the main building there, the Tokamak building, uh, is a very large building. Um, and... Um, we, we had to produce an artist impression of the site as part of our bid, so I'll show you later on the, uh, the evolution of that. But principally, the Tokamak building is the main building. That's the nuclear heart of the activity. Uh, there are a lot of peripheral buildings which support the services, the power, um, and the cooling and so on that's needed to uh, hold the plasma in place. Site plan there. So this is the, uh, this is the main Tokamak building here. This is a big hall, big empty hall in which each of the sections of the tokamak uh, will be fabricated and then using two 100,000 ton cranes uh, they'll be rolled in on, into position in the tokamak building. Buildings either side are for creation of tritium and for diagnostics and then this group of buildings here is another nuclear set of buildings which is the, this is the hot cell where the um, components of the Tokamak will be removed for maintenance in, uh, in a series of um, cells using remote manipulators. And then there's also um, uh, a rad waste building and uh, an access egress building. 
And then the rest of these buildings, of which there are nearly 40 buildings on the site, are all to support the services that are required. This building here is the, uh, the ETA headquarters. That's outside of our scope. And this building down here is the PF Coils building, which is also outside of our scope. That's been awarded under a, an early design and build contract. But that's okay. We've got plenty to go out in our scope. We don't mind those two buildings not being included. So this is a, a 3D of the, uh, the nuclear buildings. And you can see here uh, these two 1,000 ton cranes, sections of the tokamak being constructed in here. And this is the tokamak itself. Uh, all of this structure, very heavy reinforced concrete. <coughs> Ground level is, is sort of about here, so there's a significant excavation going on. I'll show you some photographs of that uh, later on. <coughs> but um, all of this designed to modern nuclear standards, including seismic, uh, aircraft impact, hazard loading, and so on. <coughs> So that's about the project. A little bit about um, about what about bidding and, and the issues that we came across. So basically, we've got the ITER organisation that will ultimately operate the facility. Uh, in Europe, we've got the European Domestic Agency called Fusion for Energy, um, and along with all the other domestic agencies, Fusion for Energy is charged under contract to ETA to provide certain elements of the facility in the, and in the case of F4E a large element of that is the buildings. So F4E doesn't have any money um, so the, the funding for all of the construction activities actually comes from the domestic agencies and basically they provide services in kind. Um, so for those of you who are interested in bidding to ETA for um, work, there are actually two clients to bid to, the ETA organisation and Fusion for Energy. This contract was with Fusion for Energy. Um, they were looking to two contracts at the time. One was the architect engineer and the other one was support to owner. Basically the, the team that will support the client. The client is a very small team. Their buildings... Um, people consisted of two people and they're managing a 150 million euro contract so they need to support themselves and rather than build up their team <coughs> they, they chose to uh, engage an outside um, agency to support them so as I said it took us a long time this it took us best part of uh, two years there was almost one year of what I would call prospecting that's uh, building the relationships, understanding the opportunity. And through that period, we had our first contract win there in November 08. Fairly small, it was about £40,000 fee, so not really the scale of architect engineer. But it got us known to F4E. <coughs> in March 09, there was an information meeting for those who were interested in the architect engineer role. <coughs> And then the bid came out in April, or the EOI came out in April. This was under EU procurement <coughs> rules. So we expressed an interest in April. Um, we received the bid in July. We submitted the bid in October. F4E rejected it in November because it was too expensive, and they rejected all the bidders. So we started rebidding in December, uh, and we were awarded the uh, we were preferred bidder in March, and then we were awarded the contract in April. So as you can imagine, with a large contract, it does take a long time, and you've got to be able to have the resources and the commitment to, to see that through. And that was a big part of our uh, bid-no-bid -bid decision right at the beginning, whether or not really we've got, we basically, did we have the, you know, the muscle and the, um, and, and the bottle to, to see this through. So as part of that bid-no-bid, -bid, you know, there's an awful lot of things to think about, <clears throat> and I've sort of listed some of them down there. Is it any different to working in the UK? Well, there were one or two things that were very specifically different to working in the UK. Um, <coughs> most critically for us, I think, was the fact that we didn't really know the client. We'd won this one small piece of work. They didn't really know us. Um, <clears throat> and those of you who, who, are, who maybe are in business development will know that if you bid blind, then you, it's very difficult to find a, a, a winning edge. <coughs> The second thing was uh, that we were going to deliver this project in France. Um, so 
Atkins is a very large company. We do have a French entity, but uh, we don't do, um, in fact, we do no business really in, in France, or did, we didn't prior to this. The French entity had been set up for a particular contract that had come to a, to a natural end. So for us, the, um, there were some competing forces, um, as I said, limited knowledge of the client and so on. And really, all of that led us to the conclusion that if we were going to bid, we needed some partners or a partner, preferably uh, European in flavour because the um, European F4E is funded through the European Union. So the more countries you can have involved in your bid, the more sort of um, benefit that gives. Now that's where this um, um, positioning over the previous 12 months really came into its own because a few phone calls later, in fact I think two phone calls later, we found ourselves in a grouping of four um, <clears throat> and those four were uh, Empresaris Agrupa Dos, um, a leading architect engineering company in Spain, a very big um, link to uh, GE and they've, they've done the in fact, our um, empresarios have been the architect engineer for all the nuclear stations in Spain. Uh, IOSIS, who are a French um, big civil uh, consultancy, and ASSISTEM, who are also French and uh, leading nuclear engineering consultancy. And collectively, uh, we formed a joint venture, which we later, not at this point when we were bidding to start with, but later... Um, <coughs> came to call Engage and we have actually established a, a legal entity in France in order to undertake this job which is um, Engage. Immediately that meant we're working in a multicultural joint venture. Oh, that's great because you've got to learn French, you've got to learn Spanish, you've got to learn to have long lunches, you've got to learn to <laughs> work, finish work early. So there's all sorts of things that, um, that come into play. Um, but I would say, um, take my hats off actually to our colleagues there, English is brilliant and it really puts us to shame that you know, when, we, when we are working in multinational, uh, multinational groupings, usually the language is English, not always, um, but what I would say is that they, um, in the actual bidding, um, the written word needed a lot of time to improve and, 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 and polish, but they're knowledge and understanding of the, of the language is, um, is fantastic. And the big decision that we made very early on was to co-locate the bid team. Uh, this, just like a project, if you were doing a project, um, you would get the best out of it if people were communicating regularly um, rather than working in multi-offices. Um, so it was a joint venture with each partner with 25% share. Um, we uh, had no particular defined scope. There's a lot of overlap in, in capabilities between the four companies, and we didn't define scope. What we did was create an integrated <coughs> team and then populated that team with the best man for the job. Because we were each 25% shareholders, um, that meant that we each had equal um, uh, liability and opportunity. Some of the enablers to success. Uh, so in that first 12 months, as I've said, it was all about the networking that we did and the information meetings and understanding who, else, who the other players were out there. And then in terms of winning, I think the real key things that we did were, first of all, form a joint venture rather than be a main and a, sub, a set of subcontractors. That sent a very powerful message to the client. Um, and co-locating the bid team undoubtedly helped. Um, you know, sometimes life is really hard, you know, having to work in Paris for weeks on end, you know, it's so difficult. Actually, there were lots of people saying, oh, I'll come and help you, I'll come and help you. I said to them, if you understand the geography of um, where, our, where our office in Epsom is in relation to central London, I said, well, it's like saying you're going to Paris, but actually you're working in Epsom. So it was uh, not quite as sexy as everybody thought it was. Okay, so the project itself. Uh, this is the artist's impression, by the way, that we produced as part of the bid. Um, so the scope uh, is really split into three things. First of all, there's the, the design of the buildings themselves, which is this big chunk here. Um, there had been a conceptual design undertaken um, by uh, Jacobs for um, IO, for the ITER organisation, um, but as usual with these things, that, that was given to us um, with no guarantees, so we basically had to do a due diligence on that to make sure that we're happy with, the, uh, with, with that design. 
And then our role is to, is to really take that design once we've um, done our due diligence, work through the, the, work through the scheme, work through the detail, produce all the drawings for construction. Um, as well as that then, we are undertaking all the pre and post contract commercial management. Um, so that's preparing all the tender packages, um, going through the tender uh, process, um, recommending award. We don't directly um, contract with the contractors, that's through um, F4E to the contractors. But once those contracts are in place, we're then supervising the, uh, the construction of the contracts. And then there were some other sort of wacky and weird things that F4E couldn't be bothered to do themselves, so they asked us to do it, and that was wrapped up in the scope. Uh, well, yeah, okay, you can't read that, so we won't dwell on that. But the, the, the point of this was just to say um, we didn't define scope, as I said before. We produced a, an organisation chart as if we were one single company. We identified key roles, we then looked at CVs and we screened CVs and we said, okay, this guy who happens to be from Atkins is the best for this role and this guy who's from IOSIS is best for this role. Where we actually ended up with that is that as Atkins, we, we are, we've got the project manager role, we've got the construction manager role, we've got the commercial manager role, um, and we've got the design manager role. So uh, pretty key positions for us, which we're quite um, pleased with in the end. It's sort of helps with the quid pro quo, we're working in a different country and it helps us to make sure that we understand um, what's going on. Um, I said before about these nearly 1.8 million man hours of effort, you can see the, the biggest chunk in terms of design is the, is the civil bits and the nuclear buildings represent nearly 50%. And there's a programme there, so we are currently, we are, where are we, we're here. So, <coughs> We have just delivered the preliminary design. We're now into the tender design. Now we'll go on to construction design, all the tender action, and we'll see work on site starting on these buildings um, around about the beginning of 2012. There is, in fact, an information meeting coming up uh, shortly in Kadarash for contractors who are interested in, in bidding for this, for the construction. And I know Dan Mystery, uh, the F4E uh, liaison officer, has been desperate to try and get UK construction companies out to Kadarash um, to, to, to show an interest. So progress since March with our team, as soon as we'd signed the contract, we actually got the lead, the lead team into Paris and uh, started the mobilization period. And we have now got 130 staff in Kadarash. We worked in Paris for a while as the lead team. Then we moved the lead team to Kadarash into some uh, <coughs> temporary offices. And then when the main office is ready for us, we, we mobilise the rest of the team. 130 staff there, mostly engineers and, and, um, and CAD uh, draftsmen and uh, managers. There's very little construction staff at the moment. We've met all the milestones, including the really key milestone, which was the delivery of the preliminary design, which when I was out there about three, three or four weeks ago, they just delivered. It's 800 drawings, 200 reports, and we've done that in five months from a standing start and having to build a team. So I think that's absolutely fantastic uh, result for the team and it's really helped us with the client relationships in the early days. So the site itself, um, there was a preparatory works done to provide a plateau from which everything was going to be built. Um, <clears throat> many of those buildings I've shown you that are non-nuclear on fairly shallow foundations. But the nuclear buildings founded down well into the rock so there is currently a, um, an early works contract which has been awarded, which is um, uh, blasting away into the, into the plateau to form the, uh, the rock formation. And then coming up there'll be some tender batches, as I say there's the information meeting in November, and um, we're probably going to end up with about maybe eight to ten uh, construction contracts to, uh, to manage. So, in conclusion, um, I have to say, ETA it <coughs> is a fantastic project. <coughs> For us, it's given us the opportunity to build these pan-European <coughs> business relationships, um, and, and that's already paying, paying dividends in that we are working with our uh, French partners now to look on a much broader front at uh, opportunities 
in the nuclear sector worldwide. The one thing that surprised me <clears throat> was that um, UK business was seen with very strong credentials and, and, and that came as a bit of a surprise. We sort of thought, well, this is in France, so it's bound to be French, but no, it isn't. It's in France, but actually it's, it's worldwide and it's European. So um, that, that came as a shock, but uh, a pleasant surprise. And Frank Briscoe actually took, took me to one side when we won the contract and said, we are really, really pleased that we've got a big UK company in this contract. Um, so, uh, yes, we took some, some credit for that. And, and finally, what I would say is that um, I started this by saying uh, I was the future, but I'm not the future. EAT is the future. You guys are the future. Um, it is a great project. It will lead on uh, to demo. And the fusion scientists have always believed that by 2050, or maybe they've always said within the next 50 years, I can't just remember which one it is now, <laughs> but currently they're saying by 2050 we will have fusion and it will be the future of all our power supplies. Uh, and if they've got that vision, I think that's great, because that will absolutely transform this, uh, this, this nuclear business. So that's all I want to say. If you, if you would like to find any more information out, there is the ETA and the Fusion for Energy websites. Go and have a look. Uh, progress photographs are on there. And thank you for listening. <laughs>